In this screencast, I will demonstrate some built-in features of Emacs, the combination of them I like to call literate DevOps. This is based on the concept of literate programming. In case you are unfamiliar with the term, one of the great demigods of the Mesozoic era of computerdom, Donald Knuth, he came up with the idea of inverting the typical style of code that is peppered with comments with prose punctuated with code. While he developed a special format, we can think of a markdown file where the emphasis is the surrounding description. As you can tell by this example of the Ruby code on the left and the markdown file on the right, not much of a distinction. It might be just purely philosophical. He wrote that his approach worked well for personal clarity on complicated algorithms, but it was the emphasis on communication that initially intrigued me. Now, while rendering PDFs or web pages from a markdown file is pretty easy, it'd also be possible to extract the code. However, I really didn't get interested in literate programming until I ran into org mode. Like you, I love org mode. Strange to say, it definitely changed my life. When Karsten Dominic originally started developing org mode, he was interested in formatting and organizing his notes. The Babel extension, however, added literate programming features far better than anything Knuth dreamed. With Emacs, you actually execute code blocks right from within your document, and each block can be written in different languages. I started dabbling in it, especially when I started writing large closure applications. And once upon a time, after my project was canned, I found myself in unfamiliar territory, writing code with the DevOps team, building a private cloud project. Taking judicious notes in org mode really saved my sanity. I realized while configuring a server, if I took notes on each step, not only could I reproduce those steps for a chef cookbook, but if I got stuck, I could just email the team my notes. And this would include the complete context and background. Once I started running code blocks on remote servers with Tramp, I started calling my approach literate DevOps. However, I believe the only way to really describe this method is to, st to demonstrate one of my, hmm, let's call it a typical day. Now, let me give you a warning. For this screencast, I wanted to use realis realistic examples and not just a bunch of lorem ipsum. However, I also didn't want you to have to wait for me to fat finger my way to frustration. So, I'm using my demo it project to help type each step. However, the code execution is real. I'm also going to use some features to highlight parts of the code. I use this a lot in pair programming, and it also works really well for demos. You can use this yourself. Experiment with it. It's got that meta, uh, meta s h prefix and it has quite a few options for highlighting and unhighlighting um, code. Now, in my previous screencast, people have asked some hmm, auxiliary questions about my Emacs setup. I use a couple of packages to make org mode files look more like a word processor, less like a field of dancing rainbow ponies. Org bullets get rid of the initial bullets from the headers, and the org beautify theme gets rid of the color and just increases the font size. Um, I appreciate Adobe's uh, source code um, for both uh, the fix width and the variable width. And all of this stuff is configured and described on my GitHub repository. At the beginning of each sprint iteration, I create a new org mode file. So I'm just going to create one. And I use auto insert and yaz yeah snippet to automatically insert section headers that I'll use throughout my sprint. Much of my org capture templates expect these headers. This one's called the Fuzzy Bunny Sprint because, hey, you might as well have funny names for your sprint, right? Okay, now the next step is to copy the sprint stories and tasks from my company project management system. So I'm just going to grab these headings. And I'm going to insert them. Mm, excuse me. I'm going to insert them as subheadings. Now I've shrunk the font so that you can kind of see the whole structure. I'm just going to increase that back up so you can read it. All right. 
Now, finally, it's time to work. So, I'm just going to start to type. Now, for my first task, I need to do some investigation on different linting technologies for Python. So I just take notes. I copy and paste URLs as org mode hyperlinks, and I now have a habit of typing my org mode files in past tense, for I find that I often want to pause my work to synchronize with my team members, and I don't want to have to re-edit things. I use Magnar's favorite uh, expand region to quickly select the prose that I can write, and then I can send it to them. But the real trick here is not just taking notes with org mode, but to actually execute code that I'm actually using, and I can send that code that I type to my teammates. Here's an example. First of all, let's get rid of this, and let's try to install this Flake 8 project. Now, for any time I try to uh, install some Ruby or Python um, packages, I'm always creating a virtual environment. So I'm going to type the commands that I'll use to create that virtual environment in a source code block. The shortcut here is the less than s, some keys I guess, <laughs> not really key bindings, it's a little strange, because you just type this command and hit um, tab. This will expand it as a source code block. I now just type sh for the language, and we start to go. Here we go. Now normally I would probably just copy and paste this from Stack Overflow because isn't that the way we program nowadays? Now all I need to do is execute it. You can execute any code block within a um, org mode file by hitting the Control C um, key twice. So I'll just do that and it's installed. Perfect. Now, in this case, I don't want to send the results to my teammates if I do highlight this code, so I'm going to just tell them, or tell the export command, to just send the code. All right, I want to give these instructions to my teammate, so I select, and then I use a little feature I found in the org contrib plus project. This is the only thing that uh, you'd need to install from um, Elba. I've bound it to the con Control X capital M, and it just takes that code and puts it into a MIME alternative format. Let me increase this so you can see the code here. So the first part of this alternative part is text plane, and the text plane is my org mode file because, hey, it's text, right? The second section here that you can kind of see at the bottom is the actual HTML that has been exported. And it's rendered really well, including the source code in a pre with some class styles that I can set up with the style sheet. This is the crux of my thesis. My advice when taking your own notes is to emphasize team communication like easily highlighting sections of your code and using this HTMLIs function to email it. I find that when I write in the past tense, I don't have to re-edit before mailing. The rest of my demonstration will be showing various org mode tricks and tips to keep the prose and the source code blocks clean. Let me show you what I mean. Assuming that my team and I have settled on a linting strategy, Let's actually run it. So I use Control C twice to run the code block. Hmm. Right. My Python code is not in the same directory as my org mode file. Hey, easily remedied, right? We just type the CD command. But the problem here is that I don't want this, I don't know personal line here that only applies to my laptop to get sent to all of my teammates. So I'm going to change this, delete it, and use the dir parameter, I guess we could call it, for org mode. Now this specifies a relative path of the reporter directory. Now this allows me to control C twice to actually run the code, get the results from the lint 
program, but if I send it, and in this case, I want to export both the code and the results, I get exactly what I'd like. I think this, is stor this story is good enough. Let's move on to the next story. Now, this story is about creating a Python file. Sometimes, I'll start a file off in my org mode. In this case, I use the same kind of source code block, but I specify the Python language. I can now type in the code that I want in Python. And I wanted to show this just, I guess, more of as, as an example, that you can have multiple languages within your, um, within your org mode file. The other thing is, well, as you notice, it's Python code. It's very sensitive to indentation. So you can hit Control c and the apostrophe in order to show that same source code, but in a major mode. In this case, the Python major mode. Allows me to jump up to the line, hit Tab, Oops. format the entire code base, and you can run things like, I don't know, all the lovely stuff you normally do when you're trying to edit Python code in Emacs, or Ruby, or Clojure, or whatever. Then, when you're done, you and you save it, it just inserts that code back into your org mode file. Now, I typically, like I say, do not do a lot of this kind of work within my org mode file because you can't really put it in under git control. So, I'm going to tangle this. Tangling allows me to write this source code block out to a file system as a particular file name. And now I can use magic and check that right into Git. Let's move on to the next story. You'll notice that my org mode sprint file is, well, large and complicated. So for this story, I'm going to narrow the story to just this section. This is done with Control X N S. All right, now we can get busy on this story without the distraction of the rest of the file. In this particular example, I'm going to be using that sdis option to my setup Python file to create a tar file. So, I, there we go. Now I can do Control C twice in order to run it. All right, hmm, I don't see the actual name of the tar file. I kind of wanted to look inside it, but I'll need that. Well, let me come out, let me come back to that for in just a minute. Now, all of the commands that I'm going to run in this section, I know are going to need to run within this reporter directory, and I don't want to have to specify it for each and every source code block. So, I'm going to shrink this down so I don't have to look at it by hitting the tab key, and then take this code and actually remove it and put it up above as a property. Now normally the properties are in a drawer that are collapsed, but if you hit tab you can see that the dir uh, property is now uh, up at the top level for this whole section. This means that every source code block will have these properties as its default. It'll still work just the same way though, but now I've got it so that I don't have to type it for every block. Now I want to analyze that tar file, so just like I would at a terminal, I'm going to get the directory listing to see what, uh, what the name is using our good old friend ls. I can run it twice, and the output of it gets inserted here. Great. I'm going to want to use that file name, and I don't want to have to type it all the time. So I'm going to name this block. When I run it, again, now the results are attached with this name. Let me show you how I use it. I'm going to have a new block of code, and in this case, I'm going to specify a variable called zip, and it's going to refer to this tar archive. Notice this label, tar archive creates a thread of data generation and usage. Now, when I run this, the zip variable is replaced with that tar archive name, and I get the output that I want. Interesting. 
These are a lot more files in here than I expected. I wonder what some of these are, what they actually contain. So, in this case, I'm going to name this and change the results to be a table. Naming it contents, and when I run this, there we go, the results are named with this contents world word, and now I can refer to any one of these file lines. Let's do that. Create a new block of code here, with some explanation, of course. And in this case, I'm going to create two variables. The zip, referring to the tar archive that I did before, and a CFG variable. Now notice it refers to... Oh, there we go. Got to show them all. It refers to this first line. Now, contents is a table. And the table has both a cell, rows, and column. And I'm going to just pull out one cell. The first column, or the first row, which is zero base, so that's really going to be the second one, and the first column, so I specified the zero. So that actually pulls that word, reporter-10 package info, as the CFG variable. So now when I run it, I can actually get the output from that command, uh, from this command, and I can see that I've got, huh, a lot more properties that are generating that I'm not filling in. I should note here that I sometimes rerun these blocks of commands in my org mode file instead of putting these commands as script files. Obviously, if something turns really interesting, I don't, and I put them under git control. But some command sequences live between being completely transient, like what happens when you type commands into a terminal, and living prominently in a script file. Everything I've shown so far could be considered literate programming for shell script enthusiasts. Now I want to show the features that make this more DevOpsy. I wipe my org mode file to see my accomplishments. This is done with Control X N W, and I'm going to hit the Shift tab twice so that I can see just my header files. And here we go. Now I'm going to jump to this one story here. I hit Control X. NS to narrow to just this org mode section that I want to work on. Now in this case, I need to install Python, or at least check what Python packages are installed on my CI server, which I have named appropriately Minecraft. Notice the directory I'll run these commands in. The initial slash and the final colon will have make sure that all the code blocks in this section will use tram and run on my remote server. This is seriously cool. Let me and let me prove it. Okay, I'm just going to run the host name command and it'll execute on my uh, remote server. I hit control C twice. It makes a connect, an SSH connection over to my remote server, copies the program, which is just the word host name, and then copies the results back. There we go. Like I say, seriously cool. Let's move on and actually get some work done here. I'll make a little note about this, the fact that I'm not getting the fully qualified domain name. And then we'll get, what I'd like to do is get a list of the packages that are Python related that are installed on my server. Here's the cryptic command uh, calling dpackage because I'm using a Debian-based system and just using a typical Unix-y type pipe command sequence. Control C twice, and it copies this mini script over and executes it, and I get the results. Hey, well, I get the results. I'm not too crazy about how they look. Let's see here. Let's see if we can't fix that up a little bit and get rid of those installs that are on the right-hand side. All I need to do is pipe in yet another thing to said. Hmm. Well, let me run it here. Copies that over, runs it, copies the results back, formats them as a table, and I get the results that I want. 
but it's getting a little ugly here. Sure, this is the Unix way, but I may not want to have all of this clutter if I do decide to send this kind of information over to my teammates. So um, Babel has a feature where we can actually have the output from this code passed in and reformatted. So here's a typical example. Um, I have a source block. Now this time I'm using elisp. Yay, lisp. And uh, it takes a variable called data, which I'll just keep blank. And we're going to call it column one. Now, the actual code is just a simple called a map car. Map car uh, iterates over the data, which will be a list of lists. And it calls car, which gets the first element of each entry. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just getting the first entry of a list of lists and I should get a nice column. So all I need to do is get rid of that said line and call the post command to call this column one. Now here, column one, I assign the data variable to asterisk this asterisk. This is the uh, essentially the output from my command. So we'll kick this off. Now in this case, it pulls everything across, cycles it through my little um, code block, and I now have a list of those Python packages. Booyah! Clearly, this column one code block of lispy goodness isn't something that we actually want exported. The org mode Babel project has a concept called the <laughs> Tower of Babel, where you can create org mode files with these sorts of helper blocks, and they're accessible to every other file. Let me load one of my personal tower files. Oh, too small. Let me increase the font size. Now, the really nice feature is that you can open up a can of litter programming on this stuff to test and describe it well. I created this table filter to both format and filter shell string output. Here's the actual code. Yeah, it's a bit long. However, I can specify the includes and the excludes and filter through it, and it still has this data that comes in. It's a bit more involved, but hey, I don't have to see it. Now, to specify that this file is part of the Tower of Babel and should be accessible, type Control C, Control V, and I, and then load up the file that you want, and one has been added to your Tower of Babel. Now it's available everywhere you need to go. Now. Um, so let's go back to the sprint page. Let's see how I can use this. So in this case, I'm just going to call the D package. I'm not going to go through all of those pipes, but in this case, I'm going to call my table filter as a pose command, specifying what to include, what to exclude, and of course the data set to the output. Let's see how this works. Run Control C twice, and copies over, copies back, goes to the filter, and voila, I've got it. Very nice, however, there's back to having this install column. And yes, we could pass it through column one. In this case, this gets a little funky, but column one's data is the result of this table filter. Control C, Control C again, and let's get this list. And there it is. Whenever I talk about Tramp along with Org Mode and this whole Babel business, I'm always asked if it's slow. As you can tell, it's kind of slow, not too bad. However, there is some ways of speeding it up. There's a property called session, 
what this does is it keeps the connection alive for all of the blocks that have the same word. It's just a label. So let's try it out. In this case, I've got a code block that's going off to my remote server, and it's using this session. So I'm going to run it. And what? Three seconds? Let's do it again. Hit Control C twice again, and it comes right back. So you can see that it's a lot faster. There's another feature with setting up this session, though, and that is the fact that it's a buffer. And you can see everything. Well, I guess you could if you happen to have better eyes. Let me increase the, sh the font size. You can notice the host name dash I, and there's two of them because I called it twice. There's also this echo that uh, org mode uses um, to find out the actual limits of the output that it needs to copy back into the buffer. Yes, you can set up variables and other things within this shell, because it is just a shell command, and those are accessible, or at least it'll influence the shell scripts that you run from your org project. Hyperlinks in org mode are just the same as with tramp. You begin with a slash and you have a colon and you can specify the full path name. Here I'm going to load up a file, my web page, on my web server. So I just click it, it downloads the file, and allows me to go through and edit it. It's kind of cool, especially when you have lots of files all over the place. You can describe them in your org mode file and just access them with a click. What's really interesting, well, as if I'm overusing that word, you can specify a way to get through firewalls by using this pipe character. Now, in this case, you can't use the default SSH uh, protocol that I've been using before. You have to specify it here. So you do a slash SSH and a colon, your first host, and then the pipe, and then your second host and the pipe, and you keep on going until you eventually get a colon and your host name. This is really slick when I, you're working with, well, in my case, a, a private cloud that's embedded in a data center and I need to access some virtual machines running on top of it. Now you can change the protocol as well. So here in this example, I start off with the SSH protocol to make a connection to my server, but then I'm going to use the sudo sudo pro, uh, protocol in order to edit a file on my remote server as root. Here we go. And there I have it. I'm now editing Etsy password as root on my remote server. So, I guess now is the time for some questions. Leave them below. But here are some links to my original essay that got me started on all of this, as well as a link to my demo it uh, code that helped me write this whole presentation. And if you're curious about how I format my Emacs, check out my dot files. Thanks for watching.